John chapter 13 this morning. As we continue to work our way through John's gospel together. We're going to pick up this morning in verse 31. We're going to read through verse 35, um, and we're really going to focus our attention on verses 34 and 35. So these other verses are kind of setting up the thing that we'll spend most of our time talking about this morning. There in verse 31, we read this. So when he, and that pronoun there is a reference to Judas. So when Judas had gone out. Now, this this marks a very important moment now as the events of the cross will begin to unfold. This is kind of like the starting gun for the events of the crucifixion to begin to unfold. Judas will go out from here. He will go meet with the religious leaders and he will he will take them to the Garden of Gethsemane where he knows that Jesus will be alone with his disciples and there Jesus will be arrested. And so we read here, Jesus responds, knowing where Judas is heading, uh, Jesus responds, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him uh, in himself and glorify him immediately. What do you think would be the main thought in those two verses, in one word? Glorify, right? Now, the, the glorification of God, it's, it's the idea of God revealing himself. And there's nowhere where God is glorified more than in the work of the cross. Jesus says there at the end of verse uh, 34, he, I'm sorry, end of verse 33, he says, he'll glorify him immediately. He's saying, now it's that time where the Son of Man will be glorified, Jesus going to the cross. And then he turns to them and he says, little children, which I think is a very interesting way uh, to uh, refer to 11 burly men who are sitting around a table eating meat. Little children, I say to you, I will be with you a little while longer. You'll seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. Jesus says to these guys, listen, he's with these guys. He says, I'm about to go out and be glorified. And he says, and then where I'm going right now, you can't come there. Then he says this, so now I say to you. Here's the idea. Jesus is going to go to the cross. The cross is going to result in his death. His death is going to result in a separation physically between him and the world that he came to save. And what Jesus is doing is he's essentially saying, I am now giving the care of that which is most precious to me that which is so precious to me that I would wrap myself in human skin and I would hang on a cross to bleed and die for. And that precious thing to Jesus is is humanity. That precious thing to Jesus is the souls of men and women. That precious thing to Jesus is the world. That's what he loves. That's what he cares about. And he says, listen, I'm gonna be glorified and then I'm leaving and you can't come with me. In essence, I'm leaving what is precious to me into your care. And he says, so now I say to you, he's going to give him instructions. Have you ever left that which is most precious to you in the care of someone else? You know, I think about when the children were little, you know, and the first time leaving your child into the care of someone else. Now, when it's the fourth child, you don't care. You'd let baboons take care of the fourth child. But the first child, you know, it's like you kind of think you're the only two people in the world that have ever parented before. You, you think that there's no child that's ever been like your child. And so you're so overcautious and overconcerned and you put that child into the care of someone else. And as you're walking out the door, it's like, wait, wait, oh, wait, let me just tell you one more thing. And oh, 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 and just wait one more. And you're given those, those things because your child's so precious to you. What's precious to Jesus, what he loves more than anything, he gave his life for humanity, leaving it into the care of us his followers. And he says, so now I have something to say to you. This is how I want you to behave. This is how I want you to treat it while I'm gone. Next verse, verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. I 
titled this morning's message, What's Love Got to Do With It? And I'll apologize in advance for the melody that's now stuck in your head, right? (laughs) What has love got to do with this? Jesus is saying, I give this commandment that you love one another. What's love got to do with it? Love is a very prominent theme in Scripture. The word love is 335 times in the New King James Version, the plural another 57 times, the past tense 86 more times, the word lover and lovers 26 times, and the word beloved 112 times. Certainly love has a lot to do with it, right? The, the very first reference to love in the whole Bible doesn't show up until the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. Thousands of years of human history have been referred to without a mention of love. We know love is the greatest of all graces. Paul said, the greatest of these is love. Psychologists tell us that the most important characteristic in a home, in child rearing, is love. In in a marriage relationship, the most important thing, love. And yet, 22 chapters before love shows up. It's as if God were waiting and building and building and building for this moment when he would reveal true love. And the very first reference to love in the Bible is an illustration of God's love. It's when God says to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, take him to Mount Moriah, to the hill that I show you, and there give him as an offering. And that story is one of the most um, expressive illustrations of the work of God sending his son that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. So the first reference to love is an illustration of God's perfect love for us. The second reference to love is found two chapters later in Genesis chapter 24. And that's where Isaac loves his wife, Rebecca. And it's that picture of the most intimate love that we know, the love between a husband and wife. The third reference to love is another chapter later. It's, it's uh, when uh, it's a reference to the love of parents for children. It's when we read that Isaac loved Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob. And it's that, that really self-sacrificing love. It's the, it's the kind of love that, that perhaps uh, illustrates more in our own lives the love of God than anything else. And that's where self-sacrificing parental love for children So we have this love. As love shows up in the scripture, first it's God's perfect love for us. Then it's the most intimate love that we can know between a husband and wife. Then it's the most sacrificial love that we can know, a parent to a child. And since we're covering it, the fourth mention of love is a love for man and his food. (laughs) True story. Listen, it's my life verse. Make me some savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat and my soul may bless you before I die. So it's my life verse. I quote it three, four, five, six times a day to my wife. Bring me some savory meat, such as I love, and I'll bless you, and then I'll die. So, you know, love, it's it's important. It's a very important concept. In our text this morning, I want you to notice three things. First of all, I want you to notice that Jesus says there in verse 34, take a look. He says he's going to give us a new commandment. We'll talk about that new commandment. The second thing I want you to notice, he tells us what the commandment is. He says that you would love one another as I have loved you, that you would love one another. He says, by this, you will all know that you're you're my disciples if you love one another. Do you think it's the subject? Three times in two verses, he says, love one another. Okay, imagine sitting at that table. Jesus says, I've got a little bit of information for you, and then I'm heading out. You need to love each other. Did you hear me? I said, you need to love one another. Did you get that? You need to love each other. Like three times, two verses. He's emphasizing it. And then the final thing I want you to note, verse 35 says, by this all will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so this love that we have for each other is the real test and testimony that we are in fact followers of Jesus Christ. So let's walk through these things. First of all, Jesus says he's giving a new commandment. This word commandment is a translation of the Greek word entele, and it means an order. It's an order. It's, this is not as though Jesus were sitting as chairman of the board and there were 11 other board members and all of them had an equal chair or equal voice and they're sharing their opinions as to what should be done. It's not as though he's having a town hall meeting. 
And he's asking for, you know, the feelings and the things that are people go, going through and how they think things should be governed or run. This is master and commander. This is King Jesus. And he's sitting here with the 11, with those guys that he will unleash upon the world that he loves, and he's giving them a command on how they're to behave while he's gone. James writing about this in James 2, verse 8. I think we have that for the screen. James 2, verse 8 says this. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Notice what, you, what James calls it. He calls it the royal law. This is the law that's come from the king of kings. It's the law code for the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to notice Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Now, the interesting thing about this new commandment is that it's anything but new. It's a very old commandment. Note the screen will throw a few verses up. 2 John 1 says this, And now I plead with you, lady, John's writing to a woman who has a church in her home, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. So he's saying, We've, you've had this command since the start. In, in 1 John, John puts it this way. He says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that you should love one another. In fact, this message, this command goes all the way back to the days of Moses, 1,500 years before Jesus. 1,500 years before Jesus, uh, Moses penned the need for love. In Deuteronomy 6 at verse 5, we read, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Didn't Jesus say that that was the greatest of all commandments? To love God. And then some 30 plus years before that was penned, Moses wrote this, Leviticus 19. He said, you're not to take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And didn't Jesus say that that was the second of the commandments? Later in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses would write this, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. This is an old commandment. Not only is it an old commandment, but it's not an obscure commandment. It's not like you have to hunt to find the one or two random places in Scripture where we're exhorted to love God and to love others. In John chapter 15, Jesus said this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Galatians 5, Paul said this, for the whole law is fulfilled in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In 1 John 4, this is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And then finally, notice 1 Peter 4, 8 on the screen. We read, above all things have fervent love for one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that interesting? This is, a, this is a, a, an old command, and this is a very common command telling us to love one another. And yet Jesus says, I'm writing a new commandment to you. Why would Jesus call this a new commandment if it's an old commandment? <laughs> why, why would Jesus call this a new commandment as if they'd never heard it before? I had a, an alternate title for this morning's message. I was gonna call it, Who Wrote the Book of Love? <laughs> I wonder, wonder, wonder <laughs> who it was tell you, it was, it was God who wrote the book of love, right? We've seen that. We've seen that, that almost 600 times God refers to love in his word. That, that the, the first mention of love, this perfect love that God has for us, and the second mention, this intimate love between husband and wife, and the third mention of love, this, this self-sacrificing love of parents for children, and throughout the word, the, the, the love that we're supposed to have for one another is explained and illustrated for us, both positively and negatively. And we understand what true love is by looking into the pages of God's word. In fact, if we are going to keep the command, love God, love others, the only way we can keep it is if we understand what the Bible means when it says love. 
We can't take a modern definition of love and apply that to the command and think that we're fulfilling the command. Do you understand? So this is the book of love. And Jesus here in John chapter 13 is writing another chapter. It's a new aspect of love. It's something that hadn't been seen before. In Leviticus chapter 19, when, when that, that uh, command is given, that we are to love one another as we love ourselves, right? But now look at our text. We read, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. How are we supposed to love? We're supposed to love the way God loves us. Again, that first reference to love, Genesis 22. It's where the story unfolds of how Abraham is told by God to take his son, his only son whom he loves, the son that he'd waited 100 years to be born, a son that he'd been raising now for a number of years. Isaac was probably in his late teens. And they were, he was to take his son and he was to march a three days journey to and then up the hills of Judea. He was to find Mount Moriah and there, then he was to find the high point of the mountain, the, the point that God would show him, a place called Golgotha or Calvary, the, the, the place of the skull. And there he was to sacrifice his son as an offering to the Lord. And we're told that he made the journey. And as he walked up that, that final hill, he had with him the, the elements to build the altar. He had the fire, had everything that was necessary. And his son looks at him and he says, Dad, we've got all this stuff, but where's the lamb? And Abraham speaks prophetically and he says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And they continued up the hill. And he built the altar and his son, a picture of Jesus, willingly laid himself down upon the altar. And Abraham took his knife and he took it to his throat. And then God emphatically stopped him. And God stopped him for two primary reasons. Number one, God is stating as clearly as it could ever be stated that he will have nothing to do with human sacrifice. That human sacrifice is not the means to being made right with God. That what you give up and, and what you do and your own achievements, even if it's the giving of your whole life, that's not what's gonna save you. And number two, it's to emphatically declare that substitutionary sacrifice is the method of salvation. Because God would say, there in the bushes is a ram catch it. And that ram will take the place of Isaac. And that ram would be sacrificed. And then later, 15 or 2,000 years after this, Jesus himself would be the lamb that was provided. Behold, the lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And the lamb would be provided, not as a substitute just for Isaac, to rescue him, but a substitute for the entire world in order to rescue all of us who would put faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's how we're supposed to love. That self-sacrificing love that expresses itself in giving for the benefit of another. And that's the love that Jesus tells us that we're supposed to have for each other. So he says, a new commandment, love as I've loved you. The second thing I want you to notice is what this commandment actually is. He says three times in our text that we are to love one another. The distinguishing mark of a follower of Jesus Christ is a deep, sincere love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Note the screen, 1 John 4, 21 says this, I think, and this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must do what? Love his brother also. Hey, you love God, you must love one another. But what does it mean to love one another? What does that mean? Let me kind of break it up into a couple categories. Number one, to love one another means you have to love those that love you. You have to love those that love you. Now, it seems silly that we would have to say that. And yet, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Paul wrote three times this same phrase. Listen to it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. 
Isn't that interesting? He's, he, he, how do we apply this? Well, Paul says this. He writes to husbands. He writes to people in the most intimate of all relationships. He writes to people that are supposed to love their neighbor about loving their closest neighbor. He says, you need to be in a love relationship with your spouse. That marriage is supposed to be marked by love for one another. We need to love each other. And the kind of love that we're supposed to have, husband for wife and wife for husband, is a self sacrificing love, a love that denies itself in order for the betterment of the other, that love that's illustrated in the cross. Secondly, we're told in Scripture that we're not only to love those that love us, but we're to love those who don't love us. Note the screen. This is Luke 6. Jesus says, I say to those of you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Now, I want to tell you, when Jesus said this, this was revolutionary, okay? And today, it's still revolutionary. We might be a little more comfortable with the phrase, but the idea behind it, that we're to love people that hate us, that the response when someone mistreats you is to respond with love goes against every aspect of fallen humanity. We hate that, (laughs) right? Turn the other cheek. Why? Well, because when you get hit in this cheek, you turn this way because it's you can get you can get launched back better to get a you know more solid thrust right when you when you respond. Is that what Jesus is saying? Listen, the idea Jesus is saying that that the love that we're supposed to have is for people who don't love us. Jesus went on to say this in Luke. He said, "If you love them that love you, what thank do you have? For sinners love those that love them." He's saying, listen, one of the chief characteristics that shows evidence that you have the Spirit of God living in you and living through you is the fact that you love people that mistreat you. Thirdly, we need to love those who have chosen not to follow Jesus. Listen to this statement. It's it's in the story when the rich young ruler came to Jesus. Listen to what, what we read. It's in Mark 10. Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And it says, and this man went away sad because he had many possessions. Here's what's happening. Here's a guy who's choosing, Jesus knows it, he's choosing not to follow Jesus, he's choosing to live his life in opposition to Jesus, and how does Jesus feel about him? He loves him. In fact, Jesus loves the world. He came to die for the world. The greatest expression of God's love in all humanity was not for the righteous. It was expressed for us when we were living in rebellion against God. That's how God feels about the world. And so we need to love the world. We need to love those who are not in relationship with God. The word that's used here in in John 13, the word for love, it's that that word that you became a Christian and you started hearing it, the word agape, agape. Before you came to Christ, you'd never heard that. Okay, now it's like the one Greek word you know. Okay, we we call the building next door to us the agape house. It's the love shack, okay? (laughs) That's what that means, right? Okay? When, when we were building it, one of the guys that was, was working on it, and he was the guy that did, got all the keys to us, he kept hearing us refer to it as the agape house. He wasn't a believer. He'd never heard the word. And so we got the keys. He gave us the keys, and, the, and it said on the key, Gopi house, G-O-P-Y, I think he spelled it. Gopi, like, I guess it's the Gopi house. Don't know what that means, but that's what these crazy people are calling it. Okay. This word agape is, is a word that it, it's one of the, the Greek words for love. There are many. And it's a word that, it, that uh, captures that concept of God's perfect love for humanity, that, that self-sacrificing love. It's the love that he has that causes him to give his son for the whole world that whoever believes would be saved. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus is commanding us. He's not asking us. He's not counseling us. He's not encouraging us. He's not instructing us. He is commanding us to love with that kind of love. Those that love us, those that don't love us, and those that don't even want to follow him. He's commanding that love. Now, how can he command us to do something that was impossible? 
Because when Jesus commands us something, Jesus also provides the wherewithal in order to do it. This love is not something that comes from, from, you know, welling up in myself and determining that I'm going to love. This love is something that comes as a work of the Spirit of God. Notice the screen, Romans chapter 5. Paul wrote this, Now hope does not disappoint. Here's why. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that was given to us. This love fills, it pours into our heart to the point of overflow as a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of God. And what we need more than anything else is we need a work of God in our life. Paul Paul said this, he said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, agape. It's the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, as you grow in relationship with Jesus Christ, this love is going to develop in you. And if you look at your life and you say, listen, I'm wanting in love. I'm having a hard time loving my spouse. I'm having a hard time loving my children. I'm having a hard time loving my coworkers. I'm having a hard time loving this one person. They just irritate me. Every time I get around them, it's just so difficult. I have a hard time loving the world. The world disgusts me. and I have a hard time with it. Listen, what you need is to abide in Jesus Christ. And you need the Spirit of God to produce the love of God in your heart. Now, I want to give you a couple of practical things, okay? How we can obey the command of Jesus to love others. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we will admit that there are people that we don't love, okay? If we're sitting down and we're honest, we'll admit that there's people that we don't love. How do we deal with it? Let me give you a few tips. Number one, you need to recognize that you don't love them. And then you need to confess your sin because not loving them is sin, okay? So you don't don't need to blame it on them or try to justify it or ignore it. You need to say, this is sin and I'm wrong for doing it, Lord. Number two, you need to recognize that love is more an action than it is a feeling, okay? Remember, if we're gonna keep the command to love one another, we also have to define love the way the Bible defines it. We don't go to match.com where the little freaky little love is cartoons, those weird little naked people and, you know, love is, you know, a sunny afternoon or love is never saying you're sorry or love is a snow cone on a hot day or whatever, okay? That's not how you're going to define, that's not how you're going to define love, okay? You're going to define love by what does the Word of God say, okay? That's how we define it. And love, biblically, is action much more than it is emotion, in, in, in fact, the emotion of Jesus, as it leads up to the, to the cross, we find him in the garden on his face, sweating blood, pleading with God not to go to the cross. That's the emotion. What's the action? I will, and he goes to the cross. Keep this in mind. Both physically and in importance, your mind is above your heart, okay? Your mind is above your heart, and your will, as it is... Um, as it is, what's the word I'm looking for? Conformed, not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your will, as it's renewed by the will of God, is superior to your emotions. Your mind is above your emotions. You cannot live out your Christianity following your emotions. You have to live out your Christianity having your emotions in subjection to your will that's being transformed by the Word of God. That's how you live Christianity. The emotions have to take second place to the will. Now, what action should we take? Let me give you three. First, someone that you don't love, here's what you should do. You should pray for them. Pray for them. Now, you're already praying for them to change, so let's take the... The, the words of Jesus. Jesus says we ought to pray blessing upon those that mistreat us. So you have, a, you have a hard time with somebody? Pray that God blesses them. Now, bless can sometimes sound like blast. I didn't say blast, okay? I said bless, okay? Pray that God would pour out his goodness on them, that he would take care of them, that he would, that he would encourage them. If the reason that they're, they're the way they are is because they, they aren't surrendered to the Lord, pray God leads them to Christ. But listen, pray God's blessing into their life. Second, stop being critical of them. Stop bringing what's wrong with them into your mind and out your mouth. Stop. 
Paul gives us the secret on how to have relationship with one another. Paul said this. He said, I thank God upon every remembrance of you, and I pray always for you. Thanking looks back, right? Looks back at what's been done. Praying looks forward to what needs to be done. And so Paul's looking at people. He's saying, when I look at somebody, I can, I can spend my time just thanking God for what's been done, even though I know there's a lot of work still to do. I think there were some people that Paul might look at them and the only thing he could thank God for them was, hey, they used to be idol worshipers and now they followed Jesus. And that's all I got. <laughs> they got everything else is messed up in their life, but they got that one thing going for them, so thank you so much, Lord. Can I encourage you, instead of focusing on what it is that's wrong with them and being critical of them, that you focus on what's right with them and celebrate that in the Lord? Finally, number three, the third step is go out of your way to show kindness to them. Go out of your way to be kind to them. Jesus talked about going the extra mile. Now, this is not hypocrisy. It is not hypocrisy. Get this in your head. If you're asleep, if the person next to you is asleep, somebody wake somebody up. Okay, but listen, pay attention. It is not hypocrisy to feel one way and behave another way. That's not hypocrisy. That's called Christianity, okay? Hypocrisy is to be a Christian and follow your feelings when they are telling you to do something wrong. That's hypocrisy. But it's not hypocrisy to feel one way and behave another way. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, the rule to love one another, the rule for all of us is perfectly simple. He said, don't waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as though you did. As soon as we do this, we will learn one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love them. Don't let your emotions lead you. Act as a believer. This brings us to our final point, verse 35. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The Apostle John said that loving one another is the proof that we've been born again. In 1 John 3, he said this, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. The idea is that the true test of your Christianity is love for others. And the testimony of your Christianity is love for others. As we love one another, those that are, love us, those that don't, those that aren't following the Lord, that's the true test of our Christianity. And it's a testimony that will lead others to Christ. One man put it this way. He said, in giving this command, Jesus did something the world had never seen before. He created a group identified by one thing, love. There are many groups in the world, and they identify themselves in a number of different ways. It's by skin color, by uniform, by shared interest, by alma mater. One group has tattoos and piercings. Another group abstains from meat. Yet another group wears funny hats. The ways people characterize themselves are endless. But the church is unique. For the first time and the only time in history, Jesus created a group whose identifying factor is love. Skin color doesn't matter. Native language doesn't matter. There are no rules about diet or uniforms or funny hats. Followers of Christ are identified by their love for each other. Isn't that wonderful? He says, here's the deal. I'm leaving. I'm leaving the most precious thing that I have, the world, in your care. Here's what I want you to do. Love each other but I'm not tall, that's okay. I'm not smart, that's okay. I'm not outgoing, that's okay. Love one another. Now this love, Jesus said, will attract others. He said the world will know that we're disciples. They'll be drawn to us because of that love. One last thing I wanna share with you. I read this story regarding a woman who had been imprisoned in the Soviet Union for sharing Christ. This was a number of years ago. And she writes um, some, of, or recorded here, are some of her journal writings. She writes this, I'm still in the same place of exile. There is a godless society here. One of the members became especially attached to me. She said, quote, I can't understand what sort of person you are. So many here insult and abuse you, but you love them all. 
She has caused me much suffering, but I've prayed for her earnestly. She writes again, another time she asked me whether I could love her. Somehow I stretched out my hands toward her. We embraced each other and began to cry. Now we pray together. She writes again, she accepted Christ as her personal savior and testified boldly of her faith in Christ before all. Because of her fearless testimony, she was beaten and imprisoned. And then she writes this, yesterday for the first time I saw her in prison. She looked very thin, pale, and had marks of her beatings. The only bright thing about her were her eyes, bright and filled with heavenly peace and joy. I asked her through the bars, are you not sorry for what you've done? No, she firmly responded. If they would free me, I would go again and tell my comrades about the marvelous love of Christ. I'm very glad that the Lord loves me so much and counts me worthy to suffer for him. There's the love of Jesus. Here's a woman in prison loving her captors who are mistreating her, and that love is so great that a captor becomes a prisoner. Now, let me ask you two things. Number one, is there anyone that you need to apply the principle of love towards today? Is there anybody that you just, I'm not, I don't, I'm not loving them. My, the way I've been treating them is not love. And then the second question is this, how might your world change and the world change if we sought to exhibit the love of God in our homes, in our neighborhood, in our community, and in our church? What would, what would, how would things change if you decided I'm gonna love my spouse like Christ loves me? How would your world change if you decided I'm gonna love my children like Christ loves me? How would your world change if you decided I'm gonna lo love my neighbor, I'm gonna love the person that mistreats me the way Jesus loves them? How would our world change?